Hey there, I'm Brandon Howe, and welcome back to my Making a Game series. In the last episode, we created a shot for the player to shoot. Shazam. So they are able to successfully fire a shot that moves forward and goes off screen. And also, in the event that they were to turn, or whatever else we might have, shooting the bullet flies forward relative to itself. So that's nice and handy. As well, we dealt with some organization of having the shots get destroyed after a few seconds of them being fired, and them also being stored nice and organized in this shots empty game object. In this episode, we're going to be dealing with making some hazards that'll fly at the player and destroy them and then restart the level. But before that, I want to introduce you all to something called version control. And that is basically, in a nutshell, is how we'll deal with making sure that if your computer spontaneously explodes, you don't lose all your work. So, over here, I have something called GitHub. It's what we're going to be using. If you search GitHub Desktop, you'll be able to download this here. So do that, go through that installation process, and then on the actual proper GitHub website, oh, you'll have to make an account and all that stuff. Uh, this is where you'll be able to see your projects that you've made, that you've stored in the cloud, and that you'll have access to that you can then access from other computers. And it's also a way that if you're working on a project with multiple people, you'll be able to work on a project together and easily share your changes and all that. As well, we're going to be using something else that's kind of like an extension of GitHub that provides a nice interface called Git Kraken. That's all of this is free as well. Nice handy thing about this series is that everything I'm using to make this game is 100% free, other than buying a computer and having internet and all that. So download this as well, go through whatever installation process and you'll be able to use your GitHub account with it, I believe. And once all that's done, open up Git Kraken and you'll be shown this empty interface thing. So over here, start a local project, selecting this first one, that's actually the GitHub logo and we're going to be initializing a repository. So on the only account that you've made, I'm going to be calling this uh, making a game dash space, whoa, space shooter. You can call it whatever you want. Shazam description. I'm going to link, leave that blank for now. I'll be dealing that that myself later. Um, and then this dot get ignore template. There's a specific one that's made for Unity. This is basically going to make it so that certain files when you're dealing with Unity, you don't necessarily need to get uploaded to the cloud. Like, t I think temporary files of when the you have the Unity editor open and all that. This basically just handles that. All these other uh, options can be left as is. Uh, and then also choosing where to save it. You can navigate to wherever it is you're saving it. I'm going to be saving it here in this GitHub folder that I've made specifically for this. So then, create repository and clone. Ta-da! And it's as simple as that. So now, I'm going to have to actually close Unity and all of this stuff for a second to do what I'm going to be doing next, where I'm going to be moving my project files into this folder. So I have this save under here. I'm gonna copy both of these and then navigate to my GitHub folder, Shazam, and then making a game space shooter. And then it's just a matter of pasting it in here and waiting some time for it to do that. Don't know how long this is going to take. I'm going to cut away for this to be done. I'll be right back. All right, and we're back. So I've also gone and opened up Unity in, again, in the place where I stored the file. Um, now as well, something that we're going to want to do, going up to File and down here, pro or Edit, and then down here, Project Settings. It opens up this window. Going to Editor. A few things we want to make sure are set. Over here in version control mode, you want to make sure that that's set to visible meta files. I think by default it's set to hidden. And asset serialization mode, you're going to want to set that to forced text. As well, this is a place where if you decided you wanted to switch from a 3D game to a 2D game, switching that, that is also an option there. 
Yeah, so make sure that those two things are set. That's gonna help with how this is uploaded to the cloud and all that. Make sure that it has all the files that it needs. So now that that's done, and this is saved, or this is copied into this new area, going to get Kraken. You're going to notice all of this stuff at the side that's been, oh, sorry, clicking on this up here, all the stuff at the side that's been added. And yeah, all the, adding all these Unity files. So now to actually commit these changes, you're gonna scroll down here, or you're gonna hit stage all, all changes up here. Wait some time for that to do that. This first time you do this, it's gonna take a long time because 1,971 files is a lot. But then down here, commit message is basically, you're gonna wanna type a message to yourself of what you did, usually keeping it simple. So I'm just gonna write added Unity files. And it's as simple as that. Now, this is gonna take a while to do all this, so I'm gonna cut away again, and I'll be right back. All right, and I'm back again. Now, one thing I forgot to do is you're gonna wanna actually have Unity closed when you do this, because otherwise there's gonna be temporary files that are open, so close Unity, then stage the files, and now that they're added, and we have our commit message of what we did, you're just gonna hit, simply hit commit. Now, this is finally uploading to the cloud. Um, which again is gonna take, oh, okay. That went a lot faster than I thought it was going to. So now that that's done, going back to the internet, if you go and like, refresh here, you'll notice then at the side that the repository exists. And for you guys, it should be the only one there. And ta-da, actually, is that done successfully? Oh, sorry. <laughs> So finally, now to actually push the changes to the cloud, you're gonna wanna hit this push button up here. And that should be about done. So this first time doing this is gonna take the longest, but then just from time to time as you make things, you'll add your commit message of what you did and then hit commit and then hit push and it's as easy as that. Uh, and then you'll slowly have this timeline of all the stuff that you've done. And then eventually if you decide that you want to, that you've messed something up and completely destroyed your game and you need to take a step back in time, you can do that by just clicking a different commit message and then reverting to it. So now, now that that's finally done, uh, going here, refreshing it, we should see, ta-da, our game exists. And then you can download it from here and all of that fancy schmancy stuff as well there's also a thing here called branch where you can basically sorry sort of split the timeline if you want to experiment with doing something different and then if you decide it doesn't work back you can revert and then if you decide that you do like it then you can sort of merge branch branches and combine stuff but anyway for now we won't really need to deal with any of that it's just a matter of putting our game in the cloud so we have access to it wherever we go. So finally, we can get back to actual unity-ness and we can start making hazards. Now, how we're going to be doing this will start off being a lot like our shot where we need to just get an object and get it to move down towards the player. So, we're gonna start by making another cube, and then this time we're gonna make it a danger color of red. Uh, da, da, da. Material is there, we're gonna call it red. And eventually we could make this like an asteroid or something, but for now, with just simple colors, red means danger. Uh, so now we're going to zero this out. We're gonna call it hazard. All right, and I guess we're gonna leave it as the same size as the player for now. We could make different types of hazards later that's like long and maybe like, or one that's wide. All of that sort of stuff that can come in time. So now we're going to add a rigid body component again. And now that I think about it, this object is as well is gonna be something that's gonna to wanna to move forward relative to its forward direction. 
So I actually think we might be able to just add our shot move script to this, set the speed to, let's go two, I suppose. So it's not moving too fast. Set the same constrictions on that, on our constraints and disabling gravity and drag won't matter this time around. So now I believe that we just put it over here and turn it around. It should just move forward like so. And it didn't, fantastic. Let me see, I believe, is it moving? Oh no, it's not moving at all. How curious. All right, let me take a look at this at the, this shot move. Oh yeah, it's moving by transform dot up again. So that's not something that we want. So just waiting a second here for this to open. After moving the files around and just taking longer to open. But, so it's setting the velocity to transform to up time speed. So, I would like to know why that is not working. I believe I, it is just moving up, correct? Yes, it is. Okay, so we have a few things we could do. We could just rotate it, I guess. But I'm not sure if I want to do that because when we make whatever actual object that we want, we might want it to be able to move on its actual forward direction. So what we could do, we could set up some like if statements that affect which axis it moves on or, hmm. All right, actually thinking about this, based on something that I'm gonna be doing later, I actually am just going to create a new script because I will wanna go about this slightly differently. And I'm gonna call this enemy move because we're gonna use the same thing for the hazards and the enemies. And it's kind of the same-ish. Anyway, so now opening that up, when it compiles, I'm gonna try and move this using, not velocity, but using uh, rigidbody.addForce again, and I'm going to do it this way because later with an enemy, if we decide we want to have it be moving forward, but as well want to turn it, by setting the velocity, it's going to kind of override any other forces that we try to have act upon it in different scripts. So if we move it instead with rigidbody.addForce and turn up the drag so it looks kind of like it's moving at a set speed, then we should be able to add more forces to it and it will combine all the forces the way that we want it to as opposed to things overriding each other. So we're gonna set this to, so rigid to add force and transform dot forward times speed. And then also setting this to fixed update as we usually do with physics and Good old semicolon there. Now that should be it. Although, yeah, well, I'll try that for now. I might also set some kind of base start speed as well, but I will see how it looks like this first. Because as well, if these are gonna be spawning on speed, they might pick up that speed anyways before they get on screen. So that might not be any sort of problem. So now I'm gonna as well set this to the same values that we had, oh well, <laughs> different, let me swap those. The same values that we had with the player before, cause that seemed to work. So now if I run this, putting it way up off screen, it should come flying in, hopefully. Oh no. All right, so. Now, why are you not moving? Because I have the shot move script on it and not the uh, enemy move. That would make a difference. So now I'm gonna set that to 100 and it should work the same way again. And now it should come flying towards the player. Yes, all right, so that's working the way we want it to. It looks like it might be a bit fast for now, I guess in like the first level or whatever, we're gonna wanna give the player some breathing room. So I'm gonna lower that down to, let's try 60. And we'll see what that looks like. Coming in hot. 
Shazam. All right, that's going to be good for starting out. So now we're going to want to make it so that the player can get damaged by this thing and then actually be destroyed. So for now, we're just going to make it a one-hit kill. As soon as the player gets hit, they get destroyed immediately. They will wait a few seconds and then we'll restart the level. So I'm going to make another c -Herp script. We're going to call it player... Uh, health, I guess, even though it's a one-hit thing. But I'm thinking eventually we might add a power-up for, like, a shield or something, and then we'll have this script control that, too, as well. So, and then we could, I could also change this later to actually have a health system where maybe you can take three hits to be destroyed or something like that. So, to start here, we're going to be making a new different function called on... I'm going to say on collision enter. Or, yeah, on collision enter with collision called collision. So now we're going to test to see if we've. So this is a function that's going to run when the player collides with something. Um, in this case, the collision we're looking for is if they collide with a hazard or an enemy. So we're going to. Um, so we're going to have an if statement here. If collision dot getting a reference to the collider dot compare tag and we're going to see if this object has the tag hazard on it then we're going to destroy the player and how we are going to do that is deciding here if we just disabled the player game object then this script would get disabled which isn't what we want because um, we're going to need it to wait and then restart the scene. So how we can hide the player is we could turn off the mesh renderer and then it's like it's in, and then turn off the um, these other scripts and that would be like disabling it. Or we could make the rigid body kinematic that would also stop its ability to move. Um, However, thinking ahead, when we make an actual ship, if we do that, that has multiple objects in here, then that might be a... Then we wouldn't be able to just get... There'll be a bunch of mesh colliders that'll be child objects that we'd have to get a reference to. So instead, I'm going to make a child game object. I'm going to call this player... Or is an, an empty game object as a child of the player called player object. Not object T. And then I'm going to give this the mesh filter being the cube. And then I'm going to give it a mesh renderer whoa, with its only material being the blue. And then I'm going to delete these up here. Remove the component there. So now we have the player object being a child. So now we can just disable this, and that should hide the player. And then we can then disable these scripts. And I'm actually just going to take the, this moment now to add the player health scripts just so I don't forget it to add it later. And then that should deal with, for all intents and purposes, stopping the player from moving when we kill them. So. If we're going to be disabling these other scripts, we're going to need references to them. So I'm going to go public, um, yeah, game object. I'm going to go player object, and that's going to be that child object that we're going to disable. I'm going to go public um, player move called player move. What we could also do eventually. Uh, or I'm going to make another thing called player shoot called player shoot now what we could also do eventually so that we don't have to get access to all these scripts that we add to the player um, so in each of these waiting for this to compile we get the input from the player in these scripts eventually we could make like an input manager script that handles getting all the input and then have these individual scripts get reference to that input manager to get that input and then the player health could just disable the input manager which would stop getting input but for now we're going to keep it simple with doing this i think a main benefit of if you were to do it that way would be then you could in an options menu 
set up a system for changing controls and if you have all the input being dealt with in one script it'd be a lot easier to get access to that but i think that's a bit too beyond the scope of this tutorial we're not going to deal with getting that complex and fancy we're just going to stick with just getting references to these scripts as they are so now i'm actually gonna be a bit better about this and make these private wow make this private and then just get the references through the start function because it tends to just be better to do it that way um so player move equals get component player move and wham and then it'll be the same story for player shoot simple as that so now when they collide with this hazard game object we're gonna go player object dot set active false and then we're gonna go player move dot or the lowercase p eh, eh, dot enable no okay <laughs> trying to beat the uh and they okay keeps auto correcting on me don't appreciate that too much but oh well so dot enabled equals false and then player move uh shoot ha uh, yeah dot enabled equals false and then if we're going to be having a delay before we restart the level we're going to need a coroutine for that so i enumerator i guess wait to restart bam and then we're going to call that coroutine over there so start coroutine wait to restart bam so now we're then also going to set a variable up here called public uh float uh respawn time respawn time and then yield return new wait four seconds uh respawn time and that should be that and then now we're going to actually restart the level now how we're going to do that is just reloading the scene and in order to do that at the top so we have these using things uh we're going to add a new one called using unity engine dot scene management and that's going to deal with transitioning between scenes so now how we're going to reload the same scene that we're in is going scene manager dot load scene now going between scenes would be you just type in the name of the scene in here and it would work like that now we could just retype in whatever this scene name is i think it's like sample scene or we could rename it to level uh something like that but we're gonna want this to be fully functional for whatever level we're in so then we're gonna want to get the name of the scene that we're currently in which is we're gonna get that by going scene manager dot get active scene dot name and it's as simple as that and then one other thing i'm going to do to be even fancier i'm going to change this to private as well and get the reference uh to that as well so player object equals now this would be um game object dot no if we're getting a child object you can actually go tra oh, transform dot find and then that's for finding a child game object and i'm guessing that it's probably better to use this than game object dot find um player object and then but that's going to get the transform so we're going to go dot game object again and that will get the reference to that just less stuff that we have to set up in the editor uh who all right so now we have our player health and we're going to set the respawn time to let's say two seconds so now 
we have to set up a few other things first. So this is looking for a tag called hazard. So we're gonna go onto our hazard and change this tag to hazard. Whoop, hazard. Save that there and then go to our hazard and set it to hazard. Shazam. So now, um, that should be it. Oh, okay, one thing, one more thing we're gonna have to do in order to be able to actually reload the scene, the scene has to be set up to be built first. Now, first thing I'm gonna do with this scene, I'm gonna actually rename it to, let's go, level template. Template. <laughs> so now we're gonna go to file, build settings, and in here, we're gonna drag this level template into here and delete this empty thing there. So now this is where you'll, sorry, small interruption there. Um, so this is where you'll go to actually build your game into an executable file when we're at the end of this. And it'll be hitting that build and run button there. And then there's also some more settings in here, like changing the name. I can actually change that right now to space shooter, or sorry, company name, that's me, Cyber Chroma. And this to space shooter and all that. And then you can set up an icon and splash image and resolution and all this fancy schmancy stuff but we'll get into that a lot later so now that this is set up in here you can just go and hit play and now this hazard should come flying towards us and hopefully we'll collide with it and bam we disappear and then in a few seconds we respawn now i do notice that this thing does kind of bounce off the player and i don't think i like that so what i might actually do is so this doesn't need to actually bounce off of anything so i think i'm going to set it to be a trigger collider and then change this to on trigger enter and then instead of getting a reference to the collision because there's no actual collision happening it's going to be a collider that we're going to call collider and then changing all this stuff to so collider dot compare tag hazard and then all the codes the same there yeah, so now if we run that again, it should be the same thing, but minus the bounce, which this also means that for this to work the same way with enemies. Oh, there we go. So now we got restarting functionality as well. So next thing we're going to want to do is set up something for these hazards to be spawned. Now, we could... There's two ways you could go about this. If you wanted to have these be spawned in like a set order, you could just have it here, duplicate, duplicate, and go further back. That's an option. And you can do that with all your enemies. So they all just slowly come in. And actually, I think that's... If we want to have specific levels and a level select, this actually probably would be what we wanted to do. If you wanted to have randomness, like you could have an endless survival mode or something, you could set up an empty game object called like hazard spawner and then like with the player shot you can set up an instantiate thing but then instead of spawning it at the position of the hazard you could set it up between like a random number between the x-axis being 10 or like negative 10 and then setting like y to 0 and z to 20 and then with some sort of delay you could have hazards being spawned somewhere between there and there every few seconds and then they would come in and then you could slowly ramp up the difficulty over time and yeah that's how you could go about that uh, saying that all out loud i'm thinking what we might do is do a bit of both we'll have a few levels where everything's set up linearly and manually as a fixed level and then maybe we'll have an endless mode where we do exactly what i've described except probably won't be too complex and it's coding just to keep things simple but for now we'll stick with manual levels while we create all this functionality with hazards and enemies and all of that so now finally we're gonna make the hazard a prefab just to make this easier so we can change one hazard and change them all so now i'm actually just gonna try just duplicating this a bunch and just going back who such 
difficulty here, making this oh so hard by having a bunch in one. Save it and let's enter a level like this and just see what this feels like. Finally actually playing our game. Oh no, ah. Uh. <laughs> All right, so we've got that. Ta-da. Now, next thing we're gonna do is make it so that the player can actually destroy these hazards by shooting them. And that should actually be as simple as, whoa, didn't mean to do that there. So we have two ways that we can go about this. We could make a script on all the hazards that tests if they collide with the player shot, then they get destroyed. We could also have, or we could have a script on the shot that says if it collides with a hazard, then it gets destroyed. Now, in order to have less code and therefore be more optimized, it would be better, I believe, to have code on the shot that when it collides with a hazard, it destroys both of them then you have less code overall. Now, actually one other thing I'm just gonna do to these hazards, good thing I made them a prefab so I can just switch one and switch them all, is that I'm gonna, oh, also I, good, this is a good time to mention that you could also have different hazards that move at different speeds and then you could make one that's like twice the size or whatever and then you could save that as its own prefab as like long hazard or something like that. Um, you can make one move faster and just that sort of thing. I'm gonna go to scripts and I'm gonna add a destroy by time script to these so that they get destroyed. Although actually, okay, I was about to do that, but if they are, we don't know how far back they're going to be. So it could be a while before they get into the game area and then ergo get destroyed. So we'll just keep them as is. This is a case where I guess there's not gonna be too many hazards that get spawned and they are being put in a set order. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem there. But if you did want to do that, then you could do it easily. You wouldn't have to attach it to all of them. You could just attach it to one, override, bam. Which would also work if you had multiple levels set up. Like right here, if I wanted to add it to all of them, I could just shift select all of them and bam, that'd be easy. But if you had like 10 levels worth and then you decide, oh shoot, I want to change one, you can easily do change one just by changing the free prefab. So. Now, though, to have these get destroyed, I'm going to make a, another script, which is going to be um, shot destroy. Destroy. I guess that's what we're going to call it. So now, going into this script, when it decides it wants to open. All right, so... Hmm... I'm going to as well. So this is gonna be on the player shot and then be used to destroy the enemies. But another thing we could do to be able to reuse this script so we can have it on enemy shots that would destroy the player. Or actually player shots don't wouldn't need that because we could just have the player shot, the player health deal with that. So instead, yeah, we're just gonna have uh, er, we're gonna have a void on so the shot's gonna be colliding with it's gonna be on trigger enter because this is two triggers colliding which I'm hoping will work properly so other dot get or sorry if other dot uh, get or compare tag that's what I'm looking for um Okay, sorry for the interruption there. So we're gonna go if other dot compare tag. Um, so this is gonna be on the shot, and if we get any sort of if it hits a hazard, uh, then we're gonna go and destroy it. So we're gonna go destroy other dot game object, and then it'll also destroy the shot as well. So we're gonna go destroy game object, and that'll be this game object, the i.e. the shot. So then that should be as simple as that. All right, so now, oh, now I'm gonna have to go to the shot and actually add the shot destroy script, Shazam. And now, Going out of this, when the player shoots, if I can destroy one without dying, 
And that's not working. That's great. I think there might be a problem with having a trigger collide with another trigger. I think. Yeah. All right. So we're going to have to sort that out then. If other not compare trigger, take hazard. Hmm. So. Hmm. Not sure how I want to go about this. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Uh, so there is something wrong with trying to have a trigger collide with another trigger, and like that doesn't call the on trigger enter function. Oh well, that's fine. My solution to that is going to be this. I'm gonna set these hazards to not being triggers again, and then to solve the problem with having this bonk off the player when it, dest it gets destroyed, I'm simply going to make it, and this would probably be a better effect anyway, so that when a hazard collides with the player, having it destroy the hazard. Uh, destroying, that's going to be a collider. Um, now that should have the better effect of destroying the collider. We can also get into later making particle effects for explosions. But for now, okay. Uh, and because of that, I'm gonna have to change the health over here. I'm gonna have to change this back to on collision enter as it was. See, this is also another thing with coding. I am having to go through and it, not everything works right away as you expected to. You have to go back and change things a lot, which is perfectly normal and happens in, uh, Question dot game object. Yeah. This is part of being a programmer. Problem solving. Very important. So now with that saved and done. Finally, grand finale. It should hopefully work as I'm thinking it will. So now these. So the player can get destroyed again and it respawns. But now that's still having issues because it's still set to on trigger enter and it should be set to shot destroy on collision enter as well because it's colliding hmm except that wouldn't run either because when on on trigger enter hmm thinking about this i might actually Okay, another another thing I can do as a fix. I could set this player shot to a collider as uh, a trigger as well, and then I can give it a tag that I'm gonna make as player shot. Nope. Okay, player shot. Bam, and then I can set that. And then I can go back to that collision matrix over in project settings in physics, and then have player and, okay, it's layers again, not, not, um, it's layers, not tags. So going here, adding a new one called player shot and then going up to back to collision matrix then going to between player shot and mm, player shot and boundary shouldn't be able to collide and pl or, yeah player shot and boundary shouldn't be able to collide and then player shot and player or player shot yeah it's over here Player shot connects with the player. Those shouldn't be able to bonk off each other. So finally, it, did this actually, I have to set it here. Yes, change children, go right ahead. So now that these are all colliders, it seems collisions are working better than triggers, but that's fine because we can make them explode because we're in space. So there, and then going Changing this back, collision dot uh, collider dot compare tag, 
collision dot game object that finally should work. All right, so we've had some rough bumps, but we got there in the end. This is oh come on, it's still being tricky. That ain't fun. So player shot. We got hazard. Why ain't that working properly? In shot destroy, on collision, if the collision dot compare tag is hazard. So I'm gonna go and using print, I'm gonna print collision dot collider dot tag. By doing that, I can see what it what the shot thinks it's colliding with when it hits the hazard, and then I can find out why that's not working. And that's not printing. Oh, because do we not have shot destroy? Shot destroy set up there. So on collision enter isn't running. That's fascinating. Be oh, because shot destroy should be on the object. There should be on the in line with the. Oh, I removed. Yeah. It should be um, in line with the collider, I think. Which actually doing that makes me think that the trigger stuff may have worked in the end after all. Bam, so we got finally got the functionality that we wanted. Fantastic. And why did I see some hazards getting destroyed there? Or, oh, that was just it restarting. Fair enough. All right, so that took a while. But now I'm going to try and go back to the trigger way because I think that that might work. It's the functionality that I wanted, and now that... I solved what the other problem was. I think that this will work regardless. Uh, collision, other, I don't need that anymore. So other and over here, other dot game object. Uh, all right, and then player health. I think I can actually set all of these. Mm. I might be able to set all of these to triggers now that I think about it. If it works, we'll go with it. If it doesn't work, then we're going to not. Uh, so other and then other dot game object. Finally. Which means I'll be able to undo all that uh, collision matrix stuff. I can delete those layers, which probably good for optimization things of some kind. So I don't need this at all. I don't even need this. But I'll delete that tag later because I think we might eventually need it. Maybe when we do explosion stuff. There. Everything. <laughs> all right. So now the player on trigger enter, because I didn't make the hazards a trigger that override apply, hitting play, going in, bam, that gets destroyed like we want it to, and that gets destroyed like we want it to. So finally, after all that, we have what we want and then furthermore we could also make maybe like enemies that can't be destroyed if they have armor we could do that easily enough i think we could just have like another a type of hazard that has something in front of it that has the tag armor or a tag that's not hazard and then it won't get destroyed by that so i'm also gonna go and just for some some more organization -ness, make a an empty called hazard actually hazards with an s and then i'm gonna go and do that bam so now we could also turn these on and off if we wanted to 
All right, so now that we've got all that out of the way, it was a rough ride, lots of going back and forth, but in all honesty, this is what game development is. It is trying out different ideas, seeing if they work, seeing if they don't, and seeing, having problems, problem solving them, and maybe seeing, as you saw here, th thinking you fixed a problem and then realized why something wasn't working was different than you thought it was, and then, well, we got there in the end. So, with a lot of this, practice makes perfect in terms of getting better. Uh, and it's also a matter of if you make, as you make more games and whatnot, you just build up on skills and you get used to doing things in different ways. Like, the amount of times that I've made a cube I've had to move around using force, it's been a lot. So... Yeah, but anyway, we're going to call this episode here. It's probably a long one, depending on how much cutting I might do. We'll see about that. Um, in the next episode, I think then we'll move on to making the rest of these enemy types. So we wanted to make enemy. So this normal hazard thing, an enemy. Actually, I don't really know what the an enemy that moves forward and then a hazard. There's not really going to be much of a difference between them. So we might actually just remake this to just being in enemy that just flies forward and then we can have an enemy that shoots as it flies forward shooting bullets that are faster than itself or maybe it could shoot bullets at like angles or something or they could actually be turned we'll figure that out um and then enemies that turn they move left and right as they're coming in which because we're moving these with force should work nicely with this enemy move script and then a final enemy that combines all that uh now lastly going back to get kraken when it wants to open now that we've made some changes we can go and push those changes i don't know what's happening here why is this taking so long i'm gonna try closing this and reopening it i don't know why that refreshed like that but yeah, this will probably be the only time I show Get Kraken in these videos, just to show, I don't know, being transparent with how I'm doing everything, I guess. And also showing you how you guys, how you can store all your files nicely and all of that. Okay, so I figured out basically there's problems with having spaces in the title. GitHub doesn't like that. I'll deal with that on my own time. I'll have to rename things and move things around. But anyway, so that's it for this episode. Thank you all so much for watching, and have a good day!